Jag ser att det är några som har kommit till den här sessionen. Vi väntar någon minut till tills klockan verkligen är 13.20. och ja, Om en minut så kan vi börja då. Välkomna alla ni som är här just nu. Så, då åtminstone är min klocka 13.20 och jag vill hälsa er välkomna till den här sessionen som ska handlas om gränslös samverkan mellan konst och speldesign. Jag heter Maria Hagart och jobbar på en ideell förening som heter Vetenskap och allmänhet. Vi har ett hundratal medlemmar och vi jobbar för att främja dialog och öppenhet mellan allmänhet och forskare. Det gör vi på många olika sätt. Men ett av de sätten är just att vi också medverkar i en flertalet olika EU-projekt. Och ett av de EU-projekten är just Orion Open Science. Jag ska också tillägga att jag kommer berätta lite om det här projektet nu på svenska. Och sen så går vi över till engelska. Då mina kollegor eh, Fergus Powell och Louisa Bengtsson från Orion-projektet kommer att presentera de olika delarna av hur man kan så att säga, involvera allmänheten i just eh, konst och speldesign och hur det kan vara en bra samverkansmetod. Orion-projektet är då ett drygt fyraårigt projekt som handlar om att öppna upp forskningsorganisationer och forskningsfinansiering för att kunna då ta till sig andra initiativ från slu eller andra perspektiv från slutanvändare och olika intressenter. Och det under då hela så att säga, forskningsprocessen att helt enkelt så till att engagera olika publiker, slutanvändare, även internt forskare, att man då kan ta till sig deras perspektiv. Och det här är ett projekt som då är med ett antal olika partners runt om i Europa. Och vi jobbar då med att ha testat under den här tiden med typer som co-creation, olika publika samråd, utbildningar och medborgarforskningsprojekt. Och det här då för att få till den här en, hel, en kulturell förändring i de här forskande organisationerna och finansiärerna för att kunna öppna upp och göra då forskningen mer tillgänglig för alla. Och vi har då också testat mängder av olika aktiviteter både på finansieringssidan, på utbildningssidan och då också på samverkansidan. Och idag ska vi då prata mer och presentera vad vi har gjort speciellt om inom då konst och vetenskap och speldesign. Så jag lämnar över ordet helt enkelt till min kollega Louisa Bengtsson som sitter på Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Design i Berlin. Varsågod Louisa. Molecular medicine, but it's also kind of design. <laughs> okay, um, hey, jag kan svenska, men det blir lättare för mig att prata på engelska um, för det här. So I'm just switching to English now and I have prepared some slides which I will show you because I will be talking about the art science um, corporation, which, oh, well, and the slides should be from the beginning. Sorry for that. So um, I'll be talking about the art science project which we conducted at the Max Delbuck Center for Molecular Medicine uh, in the framework of the Orion project. And the goal of like why we did it was um, we were looking for a good way to uh, talk about genome editing with the public. And um, in the framework of the Orion project, as Maria already mentioned, but she didn't really talk about it. There's also been time to talk about it, but uh, we conducted public dialogue on genome editing. And we were curious whether we can um, start the conversation on genome editing um, in a more um, non-educated, non-educative, more um, approachable way. And arts, um, we felt, was a good approach. So um, we conducted this project, which uh, has kind of the name of Would You Want to Live Forever? Um, and I will talk about how to form working relationships between arts and science. The art piece itself uh, ultimately got the name EOM, Trajectories of Rejuvenation and CRISPR. CRISPR is this new gene technology uh, with which we can alter genes in our body or actually in any living organism and pretty much uh, precisely and in a way at will. And the artist was Emilia Tika. She's actually a Finnish artist, but based in Berlin. And um, she was triggered by this guy. This is Aubrey the Great. Actually, he's not so important in this context, but 
there is basically a whole industry that he industry and research that he has funded. He's one of the super rich guys who can just make things happen like that um, in the Silicon Valley. So um, he has funded several startups which deal with stopping the aging process. This guy's a bit crazy. He's saying that basically the first human is going to live a thousand years is already born and so on and so on. But basically there are some uh, really tangible uh, results already about that we actually can stop the aging process. And Amelia was asking herself um, on the scientific level, uh, would this new gene technology, CRISPR, be a way how we can actually engineer ourselves to stop aging and live forever? And um, how would the future society look like if people would just stop aging and live forever? And then uh, she was also thinking about uh, what's actually behind this wish to live forever, which is a common topic in many literary and other art forms expressions. Um, she came to our labs um, and uh, she actually conducted some research. And this is a scientific paper published in 2016, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, there was actually shown that um, if you um, use gene technology, in this case, it wasn't CRISPR, but a different way, um, to activate Yamanaka factors. Yamanaka factors are kind of um, proteins that we have in us, there's genes for the proteins we have in us, but they're only active on a very early embryonic stage where we're still just a ball of cells. And they basically um, keep the cells, this, this beginnings of us, in a state that every cell can develop them to specific functions later. So she was, in this paper, it was shown that if you reactivate this Yamanaka yeah, factors in mice, um, they actually stop aging and they rejuvenate and they actually live longer. So she was thinking maybe it's possible to do this with CRISPR um, in, a, in a human as well, right? And um, she came to our labs and she actually did uh, conduct a proof of concept experiments together with our scientists. And she chose a specific part of the CRISPR machinery, the Cas9, it's not important in this context, but basically she could show that actually, yes, while using the CRISPR technique, she can stop cells from aging and so keep them in kind of like a stem cell um, stage. So this is, of course, in a Petri dish, in a laboratory setting, one or two experiments doesn't mean much, but it is kind of the proof of concept that it's in principle, it is possible. And then she went ahead and created her um, art piece based on that. And this is the art piece. So I'm going to show a couple of pictures about the, the art piece. So it consists of this black object in the back is an inhalator. So she was um, speculating that in the future there will be a device, an inhalator, like an asthma inhalator, but more beautiful, of course, like this one. And you can just basically add a couple of these CRISPR machinery ingredients, which are these vials in the front. And then you basically inhale. And um, while you're inhaling, you rejuvenate your cells, and that way you stop aging and live longer or forever. And basically, you have to keep inhaling because this is a transient process. So you kind of, once you enter the cycle, you kind of have to keep on doing it. And uh, then she created a, um, a scene. And she um, made a photo story about the couple. So clearly here, he's inhaling. She's not. He stopped aging. She didn't. And then she um, made a couple of um, pictures about how would their life look like, how they interact with each other. So um, if you just uh, look at this picture a bit closer, you see she's having wine and spaghetti, I think. He has some pills and lots of water, how they look at each other. She's more relaxed, he's more fierce. So there's, there's something telling, like the way she sees this, that this is, uh, he has this uh, responsibility for, you know, um, rejuvenating himself, keep himself in this state while she just can let go and live, well, the natural cause, course of life. And how they interact with nature. And actually, when I looked at these pictures yesterday, again, I just realized he's wearing this kind of mask that I see on the street all the time nowadays in Berlin, in Germany. So that was a bit of an interesting um, premonition here in this art piece already. Um, and how they interact with death, okay? so. Um, it's kind of difficult to, to show this art piece in just a couple of slides. It was a, like a several meters um, wide and a couple of meters um, tall um, exhibition with, uh, with this vial and the inhalator in, in front of it. So it, of course it has a different, uh, it, it, 
it has a different expression when you see it like in proper, um, like when you stand in front of it. However, um, what I would like to tell you that this was extremely successful. So uh, we use the art piece for the, our public dialogues and that was good to spark discussions and get people thinking about the practical implications of if we can CRISPR ourselves and the world, what would happen. But also uh, was very uh, successful in getting people to talk about CRISPR and this new gene technology in a, um, not in this utopian um, or dystopian way. It was kind of really considering, okay, so what does it actually mean? Usually when we hear about CRISPR from the, from the newspapers, uh, it's about engineering babies or uh, Franken food and stuff like that. So this was a different approach to, to the topic. And it was successful because uh, it was exhibited by well, many countries in different locations um, and also in several events. So a lot of people have seen it actually. And they were like, actually every time there was exhibition going, there was always a bit of discussion about the art piece. And then it was widely um, taken up by the media and actually international as uh, also a national media in Germany. So Nature wrote an article about it. If I said the Deutsche, they're like this big um, uh, magazines or newspapers in, in Germany. And uh, this is actually the guy in the white shirt is the mayor of Berlin. He was also standing there next to the artist. He was also there and looked at the piece. Okay, so how do you go about if you want to make a project like this? I think this is the main topic of this uh, session. So uh, from my experience now with this art piece, which was, uh, the experience was um, rocky at first and then euphoric, then rocky again, <laughs> then euphoric. So now looking back at it, I think there are some key ingredients how to make this work because this is a clash of worlds. Like if you bring a scientist into research labs, it's just different cultures that meet. So the first thing, the first important thing, I think, is to have a clear goal. What is it good for? What do we want to express? So just saying, oh, well, you know, let's make an artist residency that come to our labs or our institutions, wherever, and just look around and create something, that probably doesn't work. And actually, it's been seen around um, many of those artist residencies that there are interesting, beautiful things happening, but they're not really channeling any particular message or not really... Um, they're not as purposeful as this artist residency was because it had really a clear topic and clear goal. I think we have to also have competencies combined in the project. So uh, really have to have not just research and artists, but also facilitators. And this is from the artist side, but also from the science side. Um, it's good to have this choice. So uh, we had an open call for, um, for the artist and we could decide which artist to take. And you do really have to have open-minded protagonists. Uh, so even though our scientists are very open-minded and the artist is also very open-minded, however, when they met, there was first a bit of a uh, struggle in um, whose vision or who's, uh, who has the right to define what uh, messages come out of this art piece, for example. And then you have to have really the space and the support and a lot of resilience. And um, so just to show you what, uh, how we did it in this project. So basically the, also very, very one, one very important uh, factor in this whole thing is actually the, the money. So without funding, it's really difficult to make it happen in a, in a good way. And then we combined, uh, we teamed up with State Studio, which is a art science gallery in, um, in Berlin. And they had the access to the artists and they knew the artist world. And they also mediated between the artists and us. And my role as a public engagement officer at the MDC was to mediate between the scientists and the, and the artists. And the, all these roles were really demanding and uh, are very important in the project. And of course, we have to have the networks and the exhibition space and so on. So this is the open call. We actually had a lot of submissions. So 40 submissions from 12 countries and Emilia Tika was just the best. She convinced us. Um, the open man protagonist, uh, yeah, I just already talked about it, but I just wanted to mention quickly that this was really not an easy process, but successful and rewarding at the end for everybody involved. And the support, well, that's, that's like the village. I just want to mention that so this is the Orion team at the MDC and we were all involved one way or the other in the project throughout its uh, running time. So that's it. And this is the credits for the, um, who was in the, in the art piece. So basically uh, just uh, maybe a little fun fact. So Nico Ehrenteit, so one of the, the actor in the, the, the guy, the inhaling guy in the, in the piece, he's a very famous German actor, and Helena Novovitz, she's a Polish uh, photo model, and she's the oldest still active and like supermodel uh, in the world. And they both agreed to participate in this for free because they really like the idea. So thank you, and um, I'm open for any questions.
do we have any questions? Otherwise, I, I have a question. Um, how long, how long time, how long time did it take? I mean, from the start, from the planning, when the, the initial idea to to the final product, the art exhibition. Um, that was about a year, basically. So from like um, thinking about it, recruiting people, so uh, the uh, state gallery, figuring out the logistics of how it's going to work out, recruiting the scientists, recruiting the artists, and so on. That was. Um, that was quite some time that passed. The artist spent three months in our research labs and that was very intensive time. So she was really there almost on a daily basis. Um, and then of course, after the after she was done with the, with the residency, uh, the producing of the art piece that was basically her part, but that was quite quick actually. Uh, what also took time was of course the logistics of the exhibition, the, doing the events around it and advertising and so on and so on. But about a year, yeah. And then you also mentioned that you needed budget resources. I think that that's also something to plan for. Well, thank you, Louisa. I think we're go going to go to now Fergus Powell, who is also one of my colleagues on the Ryan Project, coming from the Babyham Institute in Cambridge, who will then give us a presentation on how game and game design can help engaging young people with science. Yes, thank you so much, Maria. And um, so, hello, everyone. Um, as Maria's just mentioned, I'm Fergus and I work at the Babram Institute, which is a life sciences research institute in Cambridge in the UK. And we are one of the nine Orion partner organisations. Um, so just to preface by uh, thanking you for <laughs> letting me give this presentation in English. So I appreciate your, uh, your, your patience there. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about an ongoing project that we're running, uh, which has been uh, funded through Orion, um, designing a, a game to engage uh, young people in particular with the science behind immunity, infections and vaccinations. So vaccine stands for the Virtual Activity Co-Creation Initiative for Novel Engagement. And that acronym is not the thing that I'm most proud of about this project, but it's definitely up there. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, this, uh, this project is a nine month project, which we're actually still in the middle of at the moment. So it ran from uh, November last year to July this year, when the game that we're in the process of making will actually be published. And the purpose of the game is to create with young people um, a game which can really engage them on this topic of, of viruses and infections. And I probably don't need to go into too much detail to explain um, why this is an important subject that we should be engaging people with. Although it is perhaps interesting to note that originally the project was designed um, to be something which could perhaps help to combat falling measles vaccination rates in the UK. Uh, so it, it was originally aimed at something slightly different to perhaps the uh, the context that it now finds itself in. Um, and so this was a project involving multiple stakeholders. Um, so the young people and the students taking part, of course, but also teachers, scientists, game designers, uh, museum professionals, other public engagement professionals, and so on. Um, and so to give you an overview of the project, the kind of uh, seed which kicked off this project was a simulator which two of our researchers at the Institute had produced um, and so this is something which uh, kind of simulates, uh, the idea is it simulates a virus spreading throughout a population um, and we really wanted to take this and sort of transform it into a game, into something that would be really engaging for young people on this topic. And we thought, well, how, how can we do that? Well, we have to work with young people in order to do that. Um, so we, uh, as I say, all of this is, is down to um, getting funding through Orion to be able to do this. Uh, but we took that uh, initial simulation to students. Um, we gave them this. We allowed them to research historic um, disease outbreaks, to research other science games and simulations. Um, and then allowed them to share their opinions and ideas with us on the existing simulator. And we also asked them to, if they wanted to, to have a go at designing their own game uh, around this topic. And this gave us uh, additional insights into the sorts of things that they would be looking at in a game. Uh, we used that to create a game prototype, which is now complete. Um, and then we repeat this whole cycle. So it's a cyclical process. Um, where we uh, 
at each iteration, we give students uh, another chance um, to share their opinions and ideas because we want to make sure that the thing that we're creating is something that is actually useful for them. And so we will then publish this game. As I say, we're still in the process at the moment. So we're in the process of making the second prototype, um, which we will take back to students one final time uh, next month. And then the final game should be released in July. Um, so I guess that's kind of my first top tip is be aware that this takes time to design um, to design games, particularly online games. Um, so we're doing this project in nine months. I would say that is already very condensed. It would be very tricky to do this in anything less than that. And, you know, it, it can take, you know, a year or longer to do this sort of project. Um, and really, unfortunately, I can't show you um, kind of any of the prototypes for con confidentiality reasons, but all of the um, additions and changes that have been made to the game, the vast majority of them have really come from student feedback. So my other my other top tip is if you're if you're going down this kind of game design route and you are working with young people, which I, I would definitely recommend, you know, working with your your target audience on whatever project it is that you're designing. I think that's a generally applicable thing. But it's really important that you are open to to actually listen to the feedback that you're that you're getting. Um, and that ability to to compromise, I think, as well, which is really important, which kind of speaks to what Louisa was talking about earlier on in terms of having kind of uh, sort of uh, open minded uh, protagonists and that sort of thing. Um, it's really important when you're engaging with, you know, lots of different stakeholders coming from lots of different backgrounds with lots of different ideas that you're really willing to kind of actually listen and, and take notes and compromise on what you're being told. Um, so. Uh, I mentioned these co-creation workshops, as I said, students were given a chance to design their own game. And although I can't uh, show it to you, um, our existing game does not look a million miles away from this central image, which was uh, one of the images that a student designed um, in, the, in the first co-creation workshop. Um, and so, you know, that's, yeah, that's just something to show you. In terms of some specifics then of, of changes that we've made from this existing simulator. One, uh, just to give you, you know, a couple of ideas. One thing that students came back to us um, quite strongly about was this kind of grey grid shape design. They were really not interested in that and they wanted something that kind of looked like a map so they could really visualise an infection spreading within a geographical area. Um, so that's something that we've taken on board that will go into the, into the new game. And another thing uh, that was really impressed upon us is that um, students really like the more interactivity, the better. So they wanted to be able to make decisions in this game that have a genuine impact on the outcome of the game. So it's not just kind of a point and click exercise where you set something up and then it runs and then you get a result at the end of it. But they want to be able to engage kind of in an ongoing way um, and in a highly interactive way. So to uh, facilitate that uh, we've come up with this idea of a mission mode where as part of the game uh, the simulation will be stopped at various points and students will be tasked with a, a question or a mission that they will have a choice on how they respond and then that will affect how the simulation continues to run um, as well as other things to do with kind of the demographics of the characters involved and other visual updates but all of the major design changes have really been steeped in ideas which came out of those workshops that we ran with the students which i think is really important to emphasize uh, in terms of distribution it's a little bit tricky as i say because we're still in the process of creating this thing but we've got lots of ideas about what we're going to be doing with it including working with other partner organizations um, in the local area um, to uh, to kind of distribute this as widely as possible. There's a number of science festivals that we're hoping to present that and so on and so forth. So in terms of kind of my top tips um, for game design projects, I would say think really carefully about what your motivation is for engaging um, a particular audience with this, with, with the topic um, and think clearly about what it is that you want to get from them when you're engaging them because if you're not clear on that then you're not going to set up the workshops in such a way or however you organize it that what you're getting from them is what you actually want and need so we had to be quite clear about what we were hoping to achieve right from the beginning um, 
And for us, uh, working through schools and working through teachers was a really great way of uh, engaging with our target audience. Um, I've already mentioned that it takes time and obviously money as well to run this sort of thing. Um, but in terms of key learnings, what we've got out of this process, even though we're only part way through, for us, um, there were ideas and insights that we never would have had if we were just designing this game ourselves. Um, so things like the map, uh, which seems very simple, um, but actually it completely transforms how the game looks and how it feels to play it, to have it in that in that kind of geographical setting. And that was something that we hadn't considered. Um, students seem to really value the opportunity to take part in a real life project, which is, you know, having a, a, a real life output. Um, and teachers, you know, seem to think that it was really great that we were wanting to speak to students about this thing. Um, and finally, it's just kind of about building those connections with local um, organizations. So here's where you can find out more and I'm going to stop now and hopefully I've got a couple of minutes if anyone's got any questions. Thank you, Ferris. It's a very interesting project and I'm sure that many people would like to know more about it when it's finalized and if there's going to be also a possibility to play it in, in other countries or in other languages. We had a question here in the chat. How many school students have been involved in the project so far? So we've had uh, 25 students who have been involved in the project um, and, you know, it's 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 one of those things where you know the the more students the more insight that you can get but also the the trickier it is to kind of compile all of that in a in a kind of meaningful way um so we we found it so so we found that that sort of number was was about relevant and so i should say that they they come from a local um school and they're sort of age 13 and 14 students that we were working with so it's it's more or less the the gaming generation, and That's was it? Right. I'm just wondering, was it tricky to kind of to go from this uh, this first idea to transfer that everything online, and also redesigning all the the co-creation workshops that you had designed with the schools and with the peop the peoples? Was it? Did you have to come have some kind of goodie bag to attract them to participate online? Yeah, so, that, so, so that's tricky. So, so we were fortunate um, in the, the way that we were able to set this up um, with the school that we worked with um, was that they, uh, within their curriculum, they have these uh, challenge projects where they work with local businesses on projects. So we would be able to kind of transform the way that we wanted to engage the students so that it fitted within within that schools and um, kind of existing structure i suppose uh but but certainly the kind of the shift from because uh, when we'd originally planned these these workshops they were going to be you know in person where you can actually speak to students and i think that's been the one trickiest thing is that all of the uh, kind of contact with the students has necessarily kind of been mediated through online uh interactions and kind of emailing their teacher who then emails the students and then they get back to you and so on. So it's it's definitely tricky. And I would definitely say, although this kind of thing can be done online, I think there is real value. I think what I've learned from having to do it online is that there is real value in those face-to-face -face interactions, which I realize for the kind of time period that we're in at the moment is perhaps the not, not the most useful observation, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's certainly something that I have kind of through experiencing this is that there, there is something about face-to-face -face interactions which don't always directly translate. Um, but that's not to say that you can't do anything. Uh, I, so I see, did you have any previous collaboration experiences to build from? Um, so not exactly for this sort of game design project, but of course we do, we do run a kind of a, a number of projects working with um, local schools uh, to kind of offer their students experiences to do uh, kind of uh, lab placements in our laboratories and to uh, kind of run workshops and things with that with them. Um, so we do we do have kind of pre-existing relationships, I guess, with the schools, but this was slightly a different way of interacting with them than we had previously. And it's one that I think the teachers have certainly suggested has, has been really valuable for students kind of working on a, a real life project. I don't know if, if you have anything to comment on that for your project. Actually, this was a new collaboration for us. So um, I do know, I, I knew the, the head of the State Gallery from before from, from different 
I mean, public engagement kind of seen as, uh, well, we all know each other somehow, even though Berlin is big or Germany is big, but somehow we always uh, meet twice somewhere. But uh, the, the idea with doing um, artist residency at the MDC in that way, that was new, that was not the collaborations we had before officially after we've done this and it became kind of public. And you see, so my Starbucks Center is quite a big place. So it's uh, almost 1,700 um, people working there. So it's it's quite big. And then it turned out that there have been art science collaborations going on in the background between the individual PIs and some, well, I called random artists, but like someone who was not like selected or whatever, that as artists do contact our scientists to do some kind of work with them, but it does not go through official channels. And therefore it's also never reaches the same magnitude of, you know, attention and, and reach and, and everything. So apparently we did have art science collaborations going on, but more on this like informal level in the background. And uh, we actually now thinking about harnessing this in some more structured way, um, because this is interesting. Apparently scientists do want to work with artists and it turns out that a lot of our scientists are artists themselves. So um, that's also like a, you know, kind of a treasure box of um, collaborations, ideas and projects there. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you for your presentations. I do, would just like to, before we just head off to the next sessions, I would just like to, to launch a poll to see what you think the will you who are participating if this session has inspired you to do any more work together with artists or game designers so we'll ask our here it is so you can ask either will you use arts or gaming in your public engagement activities yes no or i don't know maybe let's see if you've inspired anyone It looks good. So I'm happy that so many people join in this session and I will just finish by uh, giving you a bit, if you would like to know a little bit more about and hear more about um, public engagement and uh, citizen science co-creation, there is a um, a workshop on Medbar Forskning och Samverkans Marbetsmetod uh, that we are arranging together with Unilink on 20 maj. And uh, there, then there's also a, a pop-up on Medbar Forskning on the 21st of May. And also then uh, on the 27th of May, we will be participating and showcasing all the different public engagement methods and activities that we've done within Orion and some of the citizen science projects that we've done within uh, VA Public and Science, Vetskap Almanet, at the PCST conference. And you find all of this information in the calendar on Vetenskap och Almanets website. So I thank you, I thank you speakers for attending and yes, thank you all your participants for attending this session. And I wish you a nice day. Thank you. Bye. That was quick. <laughs> no, it's so quick. <laughs> like, I, glanced at my, I glanced at my timer and it said eight and a half minutes and I thought, oh no, I need to finish now. I need to stop And, and I totally forgot about the poll at the start, but that was good because we didn't have time anyway. It was like, whew, it's speed, yeah. worse than speed dating. <laughs> I know. You did, everyone did a really nice job. It's, uh, yeah. I think it, excellent presentations. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot yeah, the most for, important for piece of information, it. actually. No, you this didn't. Inhalator. Yeah, the inhalator. Oh, the inhalator. Is... But uh, they have yeah. the film. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean it's really it's uh, it's a medical treatment now against cystic fibrosis. There is a CRISPR inhalator, like ah. an actual, oh, actual medical.